I, I was always a gamer and I'd always, or, always been creating worlds, paracosms. Um, and when I went got to the University of Essex, I, I was planning to make um, a, a, a world and implement it in software. Uh, but um, I saw that Roy just started like a week earlier um, work on this game Mud and I thought, no, there's no point in me writing my game if Roy's doing the same thing. So um, he was a year older than me, so he was more experienced programming. He knew, or knew all the stuff and that. So I started helping him and certainly some other students with um, content. Uh, and then from the content, um, eventually Roy had to do his final year project. So he handed over the code ownership of Mud to me. Um, that would be 1980 and that's when I started working on it. But the reason that we were working on it, at least um, in part, um, Roy was working on it through curiosity um, because he was just interested in computers. He wanted to know, he wanted to do things. But the real, the underlying reason for, for it was because we wanted to make a, 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 our own world because the real world sucked. Hey everybody, welcome to the latest episode of the Plutopia News Network uh, podcast. I uh, am John Lubkowski, and uh, joining me today is, as my co-host is Wendy Grossman, our other co-host. Scoop Sweeney couldn't make it today, but we are very happy to welcome Dr. Richard Bartle, who is an honorary professor of computer game design at the University of Ex Essex in the UK, and he co-created the first virtual world which was called the MUD or multi-user dungeon. And it was, it kind of led to all the other massively multiplayer online role-playing game stuff we have now. So welcome, Richard, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so Richard and I met at a conference. Um, was it the Singapore one that we met? Yes, first? I think yeah. that's the first one. Yeah. Right, and I remember we we I can't remember if I chose chose it. I probably did, but we we end up sitting together in this saf late night safari through this park, watching all these strange animals. And well, it wasn't late night; it was probably dusk, you know. And um, but the thing that Richard said when he when he was first talking about sort of the change in games as they became graphical and as they started to be companies and having to attract lots of users was that the physics was better in text based games. And I found that really fascinating. It was, and one of the things that he said about it was. Um, when you fall in the water in a text based game, you actually get wet. <laughs> Right. And, and in, in a graphical game, you don't. And, and the sort of the notion of there not being really consequences for your actions in, in graphical games. So I don't know, Richard, maybe maybe you could expound a bit. On, um, um... Yeah. OK. Well, graphical games have got better in some. Now, when you fall in the water, you do get wet. Um, but other things, um, they don't work. A, a lot of them are um, because it goes into more detail graphically than um than text games do textually so all those clipping errors where someone's standing and you can see the the sword on their back is going through their head um, and that's we don't have that trouble um with text games because it's all in the player's imagination but the physics uh i mean i remember playing one game and i had a choice I, my, my inventory was was full and I found this leaf that I needed for an ingredient and I needed to drop something to make room for the leaf. And I had 99 cubic meters of ice in the same slot that a leaf took up. So which which should I should I have the 99 cubic liters of ice that took me a while to collect or should I have the leaf that I needed for the recipe? But the point was 99 cubic meters of ice not only weighs 99 tons, but also takes up a heck of a lot of space. And yet I was debating whether to have a leaf or 99 cubic meters of ice in my backpack. Now, these kind of things, um, they don't make a lot of sense. And you can see why people do it, why they do it, because they don't want to, want, um, to complicate it for the user. Uh, but 
it breaks the it breaks the, the the connection with the world. The world doesn't work how the real world works. And if it if it doesn't work how the real world works, then you, you need to know what you can trust in the world because otherwise um you can't predict what you're going to do if it turns out that the volume of 99 cubic meters of ice is the same as that of a of a leaf or well, um, that it can fit in your things, backpack um, yes 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 well obviously they say it's a magic backpack but if it's a magic backpack why can't it hold a leaf why can't i just get rid of one cubic meter and put a leaf there i mean ah um so um text games could um they had we had containers we even had things like um you can put an umbrella in your backpack but not if it's open because that takes up more room um the the physics was like that we also had um things like mixing fluids so um if you mix um alcohol with water you get alcohol that's half as strong as it was before if it's the same volume you can you could do things like uh pour from a jug into a mug and once the mug's full there's still water in the jug and the volumes of the two add up to what it was in the jug in the first place so simple things like this naive physics it was called back in the old um 1970s ai days um other things like state changes um so um if you've got icicles they kind of should melt if you're in a warm room but they're not going to in a in a modern MMO. I mean, I've seen, in fact, I've built snowmen or snow people in in braziers, lit braziers. So you've got a snow a snowman standing in a brazier, flames coming out and not melting. That's um, that's, that's very sad in a way. Well, it is. Um, now the players like the game so much that they're going to cut them some slack. But the more cognitive load you put on not um on having to believe away or disbelieve away the things that aren't working the less there is to concentrate on on, it, on play would it be fair to compare text-based games to radio and graphical games to maybe television in terms yeah. of how much imagination the player has to bring to the yes yeah um that that, that is a good analogy um in the text game based games i mean the reason we had text based games because you didn't have computers capable of graphics right. back in 1978 um at least we you did but, yeah me and roy trubshaw made made it that's I, when we I'd started forgotten it was that far back that's amazing yes yes <laughs> and, and it's particularly amazing because i saw your posting on facebook last week that that uh you had you, you had a class of students and you set them to playing it and mm. they actually a lot of them came back for more yeah because it's so old that they haven't seen it before. <laughs> yeah, uh, they don't know what text games are, so they haven't been put off them yet. Um, it's, I mean, that's quite nice. Um, maybe all this playing around with ChatGPT has given them a uh, um, a new love of text, <laughs> if uh, if not creativity. Yeah, the only the, I I never played a lot of games, uh, partly because as a freelance, I couldn't really afford the time. Yeah, but. Um, the the one that the one that everybody seemed to be so impressed by was the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy game because apparently mm. it was really hard puzzles. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so that, that was notoriously difficult, um, particularly at the beginning where you you think you'd solve the problem and then there was another step in it. Uh, those um, text adventures, which were very big in the early eighties, um, I mean the best selling games in like eighty three eighty four were the text adventures but they became um too e esoteric the the puzzles that they were putting in people were applauding them for being very clever but uh but they weren't obvious i mean there's one notorious one from what was it from gabriel knight three um where essentially you have you have to scare a cat to go through a hole so that some of its fur comes off on sticky tape which you then use to apply to your upper lip to give you a moustache so you look like the person in the passport that you've just stolen that you've drawn a moustache on and what no i mean th those those kind of puzzles are 
uh, why the industry died. I mean, they're great for the people who already know plenty of it, but the, but if there's no entry level, then no one's going to reach that stage. Um, yeah, I remember you saying that a lot of a lot of game design changed when you started having companies who had to attract lots of new users in order to keep growing and satisfy the mm. financial guys. Yeah, um, some of the things that um, were done, which would have, well, things like um, if you're playing a game, typically you want it to end. You know, there's an end, and either you've won or lost, but virtual worlds and mmorpgs the ones that i do they did used to be like that you you'd get to the end and then you'd um become an administrator or something or you'd re-roll a new character and start from scratch but um now what happens is you're putting a holding pattern playing an entirely different game all to do with raiding and then they bring out an expansion and then you start again level up get to the end put in the holding pattern and they, there's no closure they never let you finish and where people do leave, it's usually from frustration. Uh, the only, because, game, the only yeah. game I ever played to the end was Wolfenstein 3D. Uh -huh. And that was actually worth it because the end was hilarious. <laughs> I never played it, so. <laughs> oh, well, it, 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 I, it, I, get, I sort of feel bad about spoiling it for anybody who never played it. But um, when you get to the end of Wolfenstein 3D, it's this big maze and all these, mm. you know, things you have to defeat and you get there and there's a circle of commander keens <laughs> and it had something to do with there's a there was a war going some kind of war going on between id software that made made well there were two software companies yeah. that hated each other or, or something and and so that was why there were these commander keens but it was just sort of like what <laughs> <laughs> uh probably couldn't do that these days ip reasons but yeah probably but it was very funny. Mm, well, um, well, in the past, people made games because they wanted to to say something through the gameplay. But nowadays, it costs so much to make that it, it's difficult to um, to take risks. Mm. Uh, it, because if you, but the way I think of it is, you've got a six sided die, and you roll the six sided die, and on a one or a two you break even. On a three, you make a bit of money. On a four, you make a hundred times your investment. Um, on a five, you lose, or a six, you lose it. Now, on the whole, the odds are you're probably going to make money there. And if you're going to make a hundred times, doesn't matter. I mean, doesn't matter really a hundred times on a four, a one in six chance or something. That's great. But the, the the people who invest are saying, you mean I've got a one in three chance of losing all my money? And and that's the problem. They they don't want to lose the 200 million, whatever that it is they're putting in, even if they could get 2 billion back or 20 billion um, because it's too much of a risk, the, the stakes. And that's just because they cost so much to make. Um, as prices um, for assets and um, for the software and have come down, and as most more of it's been developed, um, so you can get it off the shelf and ready-made or in um, open source, then we will get more games, but um, and we will get more creativity. But the problem then becomes discoverability, because the more of these there are, the harder it is to find them, and then most of the money is spent on buying users on the user shop through advertising. I'm, I'm interested in what led you to create mud in the first place. Um, well, um, it's, hmm. there's, there's, okay. So the reason I, I was always a gamer and I'd always, always been creating worlds, paracosms, um, and when I went got to the University of Essex, I, I was planning to make um, a, a, a world and implement it in software. Uh, but um, I saw that Roy had just started like a week earlier um, work on this game Mud, and I thought, no, there's no point in me writing my game if Roy's doing the same thing. So 
um, he was a year older than me, so he was more experienced programming. He knew or knew all the stuff and that. So I started helping him and so did some other students with um, content. Uh, and then from the content, um, eventually Roy had to do his final year project. So he handed over the code ownership of MUD to me. Um, that would be 1980, and that's when I started working on it. But the reason that we were working on it, at least um, in part, um, Roy was working on it through curiosity. Um, because he was just interested in computers, just wanted to know, wanted to do things. But the real, the underlying reason for for it was because we wanted to make a, a, a our own world because the real world sucked. We didn't like the real world. I mean, it was it was awful. Um, Seventy nine was when Thatcher was elected. Was that part of it? Um, no, no, it wasn't that at all. That it was it was um, to do with the. Um, the class system in the UK. I mean, basically, when you're a peasant, it doesn't matter who's in charge. You're still a peasant. Um, you don't get um, any better treatment, whether it's the left or the right. You're still a peasant. In the old medieval times, people didn't care who the king was because whoever the king is, is still the king. Uh, it doesn't matter who's in charge. It's always the government. Yeah. No, um, I mean, I'd rather it, have a if a government is going to treat me like a peasant, I'd rather it was a government that funded the NHS. But I see your point. Well, um, we did have the NHS, but essentially people like me weren't supposed to go to university. Uh, my accent is that of um, East Yorkshire, which is a poor part of the, uh, the UK. Um, and people with my accent are not regarded as particularly um bright or worth listening to um we never heard people or infrequently heard people with my accent on the television when i was a kid um roy comes from wolverhampton which is um a an industrial city near birmingham and he sounds like he should be a factory worker uh but we were both smart and we didn't like the way that we were judged by our backgrounds and our accents the way we dressed, our interests. Um, people shouldn't be judged based on th things over which they have no control. Um, now, in in some ways, I mean, you can't, you shouldn't judge people because they're not very bright, because they don't have any control over it. Um, but nevertheless, um, we we resented the fact that we were the bottom of the pile. We only got to university because we were really smart and it happened that computer science was at that time starting to look good, but it wasn't good enough that the, the middle classes would send any of their um, offspring to it. I mean, they wanted to study uh, you know, sociology, they weren't very bright, or, um, or they wanted to study um, economics or literature or politics or something, whereas um, uh, the... Um, some, if, if you're interested in science, you could probably get in on science. Um, but I was interested in computers, uh, and I'd only the only reason I even had access to computers before was because I'd there was a large chemical works built about 15 miles away from from us at a place called Bruff, and it was operated by BP. And in order to ingratiate themselves with the um, local population, they offered. Um, access to their mainframe computer to some schools and it turned out that our maths teacher who had a PhD in chemistry had used um, a uh, computer before so he could actually teach it, teach it and then we got another guy to come in and teach um, who'd programmed for um, the early warning system at Filingdales which is a bunch of big radars inside domes uh, and um, so we were taught how to program and how to access computers. And that meant that um, we were positioned to go to um, to university. I don't Roy's, uh, um, where Roy's interest or um, access to computers came from. I think it might have come through his dad's work. So when we got to university, we were really pleased. I was thinking everybody there was going to be super smart and I was going to be the duffer. And it turned out that no. The people at university were just like the people who weren't at university. They just had a better start in life and had a better um, training. They weren't um, smarter. They just had a, 
a, a better education at that to that point so they could pass the exams. Uh, so when we wrote MUD, it was to fight against this. We, we didn't like the injustice. We didn't like the oppression. We didn't like being having to do what other people told us to do based on what they thought of us. We, essentially, we wanted to, um, wanted to be free. So MUD, the design of MUD was all about freedom, freedom to be yourself, to become yourself if you didn't know who you were. And that's that's essentially the reason we wrote it. So it wasn't just a bit of fun, although it was fun. And it wasn't just um, interesting to code, although it was interesting to code. It, it did actually have a, a political um, uh, motivation behind it. We never pushed it because it was the sort of thing that, um, as with all uh, all works of art, if you can under if you can articulate the work of art in um, in a different way, a quicker way, then you don't need the work of art. The work of art itself says it. So for a game, yeah. you have to play the game. For a song, you have to listen to the singer. It, or, like, it, or like I was thinking of the playwright Alan Akeborn, who who spent who spent his career documenting the life of the British middle class in his plays. Mm -hmm. uh, one, the, he has this line about you know, he would he does he does theater for entertainment, and then along comes some left wing guy who says, "Oh no, no, no it should be to send a message." And he says, "You know, that's that old the theatrical thing. If you want to send a message, send a telegram." Mm. Well, that's it. If you can express it through a telegram, but um, Aitbon was saying things in his. Oh plays. yeah, no, I I have always really liked his work, you know, and even when it wasn't fashionable to like his work, um, just because. Uh, apart from anything else, I just found it really fascinating the way he used stagecraft. It was really yeah. unlike anything anybody else was doing. I mean, he's got one play where where the entire house has collapsed to sort of one one flat sort of floor and and so you have actions going on in different rooms in the same space it's really strange anyway um but i i knew that you had i knew that you had made mud in part to play with identity and stuff i didn't yeah. i didn't realize the political context of it yeah um it was to, play because, with you know, to us to us you're a university professor and your accent doesn't have that meaning. To no, you. no, I you, no. We're, you, You're somebody impressive. You've been a professor for years and you did yeah. this work and, you know. Well, yeah, but I, um, with an English accent um, in uh, to a, to an American audience, um, uh, people, at least Americans who haven't lived in the UK for quite as long as you have, uh, um, I just sound English. Right, right, yeah. exactly. You know, and, um, you know, and 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 of course, a lot of it to a lot of Americans, an English accent is by definition classy. Yeah, classy, but also <laughs> the one that all the Hollywood villains have. So well, that's because well, American actors don't want to take parts that will make people dislike them. <laughs> it's interesting well, we to have a countries to do that. Well, it's interesting to have a class system where so much is based on just dialect. Well, this was what Shaw's Pygmalion was about. Yeah, and exactly. of course, My Fair Lady you yeah. know was the the what your accent is defines how you are treated in british society and that's actually one reason i've always found it very helpful to be a foreigner yes it, like, it steps you out you're out of the um, yeah i'm outside it yeah. and they don't they don't really expect me to be anything other than a barbaric uh you know sort of <laughs> yes you heathen heathen americans heathen, yeah <laughs> heathen who doesn't understand you know yeah but, no, that's fine with me, though. Yeah, the, the, uh, it's it's changing a bit now because um, of television, but essentially you can tell where people come from pretty well by their accents in the UK. Um, yeah, but in a text-based but... in a text-based virtual world, there's no accent, yeah, right? That's right. In the text world, you are your words. Now, and... now you know, John. Actually, it may not be obvious to you, Richard, but of course, John has a has a Texas accent. Which means to Northerners in the states is Southern, and and Southerners do actually do have a. Hmm? Do I really and have a Texas southern, accent? Southern, southerners do have a problem in in Northerners in the U.S. thinking that they don't, they're not terribly bright. It was worse before, yeah, the way and and yeah. interestingly, now that we have such like pervasive television and have had it for such a long time in the U.S., these accents are are going away. Everybody's starting to sound vaguely Midwestern, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, uh, our accents are being diluted but they're still there and there are still people who, who use dialects um you know they'll use thee and thou 
in some parts of the in the UK. Um, I will I moderate my accent um, when I'm speaking to people who aren't from where I'm from. Um, this is my normal speaking accent to like my students and, and people who aren't from from Yorkshire. But if I did speak from York to people from Yorkshire, then I'd um, I'd speak a bit more like this with the emphasis up and down more on the words. And then if I was speaking to people who are from the East Riding of Yorkshire, except for the big city hall, um, um, I'd be throwing in dialect words, um, things like um, beck, meaning a stream, which just, you know, and a roke, meaning a fog that comes in off the sea. Off the sea. But uh, again, um, a, a lot of it, I, I would be abbreviating words. So I'd be saying things like, it isn't over there, meaning it isn't over there. Um, and if I was, it, it gets to the point where if you're in the, your own hometown, you don't even have to use words. You can say things like, um, hey, so, well, that's uh, that, there, up there. Oh, it's amazing, you know, speak, oh, right, okay, yeah. Right, right. So, oh, those books, yeah, they're funny. Uh, well, so this I don't know, is, this so is so where AI is, this is where AI is useless. We, <laughs> we will know that AI is actually achieving something when the, it's, it's a line from the movie Broadcast mm -hmm. News where, uh, where Holly Hunter is trying to get Albert Brooks to meet her. And he finally says, oh, all right, I'll meet you at the place where we did the thing that time. Yeah. You know, a human understands that. An AI yeah, has no yeah. chance. Needs to know the uh, the context, yes. As, um, turn left at the Green Man. What? Oh, the pub, the Green Man pub. Oh, right, yeah, okay. You know, speaking yeah, of AI... He I... mentions the Green Man. Speaking of AI, I, I noticed that your degree was a degree in artificial intelligence. And it was some time yeah. ago. I wonder how different was that then from what we talk about now as artificial intelligence? Um, yeah, okay. So, yeah, my PhD is in artificial intelligence, and I did it so that I could create intelligent creatures, uh, inhabitants of my, my virtual worlds. Um, back then, um, it was all symbolic. AI suit was symbolic. So everything was done in terms of symbols and um, structures and arrangements between between them. And um, nowadays, this is called good old fashioned AI, um, often um, sarcastically. Uh, modern AI is more to do with, this is the word I have terrible difficulty saying, statistics. Yeah, um, it's, it's all math to, and statistics and probability. Yes, yeah. stats, I'll have to say. Uh, and, that, and it's meant to do with stats and brute power com, uh, comp computers. Um, now, we didn't have the brute power back then. Uh, we did have this, the stats. Um, and people did know about um, random search methods, but they were never able to do them quick enough to, 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 do, uh, to take advantage of them. So it was more, of a, more to do with heuristics. Um, and um, structuring um, back then. So today's AI, well, the neural networks were coming in just as I was um, leaving university to go off and get a job in the, uh, in the big wide world, uh, although I had been a lecturer for a few years before I did that. Um, the diffusion models, they're relatively recent. They, they, they've come out of nowhere. Um, like within 10, you know, 10 years ago, there weren't a thing. Uh, things like um, genetic programming, that was again, that was um, that was tried, but the genetic, um, I, I never really um, liked the analogy that they have and, and the way that they were trying, you know, you take the sequence and you reverse it. Well, basically you want to permute it. Why are you reversing it? And you, you want to permute it. Why would reversing be any different be special privileged over some other so that kind of thing was again things that were coming out that weren't um exactly in line with what i would um was interested in at the time i wanted things to get i wanted it to work without needing some whacking great big network of computers all talking to each other just to get it to do anything uh today's um Computers, yes, I mean that they've got all the uh, all the heft behind them, so much so that you know they're close to being analog computers. There's so much going on there that we don't know how they're working. 
well, we know how they're working at one level, but not the individual levels. And there's a lot of good could come out of it, a lot of evil as well, but um, that's the same with most technologies. Will it, do you think that AI is going to become an influence on games and how games are created now? It already is an influence on how games are created. Um, at least half the games programmers surveyed um, for the for GDC in advance of GDC have said that they've used AI um, in their work. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, what's GDC? Oh, the Game Developers Conference. Um, th so yeah, there's it, there's a big take up. Um, Artists are in, in a, a lot of trouble because they um, uh, much of their work can be replaced. There are ethical concerns, but um, if you're Wizards of the Coast, say, and you've got a vast bank of artwork that you actually own because it was work that you paid the artist to create, um, then you can train it on that. You don't need to train it on other people's work. Um, Similarly, if you've got lots of games like World of Warcraft's got so much um, artwork in there, it would be not too hard to get that to create new models and things for you. Uh, once you set it up, you could do do a, um, a lot with it just by training it on stuff you already own. Um, text uh, you can use you can use it for um, creating ideas, but at the but at the moment it just reads too turgidly. Uh, you can tell it do not read turgidly and it will explain that it's not reading turgidly and then go ahead to read, turg read turgidly. Uh, but eventually, if they've got enough uh, to train it on, then... The one saving uh, grace in this may be copyright in that you, you cannot copyright something that's made by an AI. That's true, but and, um, who's and to a lot say... Of companies, and a lot of companies, you know, that, that's, that would be important. It would be, but... Um, Okay, so um, I create a book and I use AI to create the cover for me because I'm useless at it. Um, <laughs> that right. would be me. Yeah. <laughs> so do I, um, if I, if, um, if I then get a person, a real live artist to paint what the AI has created, that's okay. But if the, uh, and I do own copyright in that, um, well, assuming only I, if the artist you, you you would have to you would have to yeah make work for hire the but yes yeah. yeah but but the, but if they paint something which is AI generated then that there's copyright in that but there isn't any other well I mean you can get there's plenty of ways actually you can hang get, on yeah. actually hang on in the UK anyway there's just recently been a court judgment it was in a, a case of somebody using presentation software. Mm -hmm. But one of the consequences is that museums and galleries and stuff who've been uh, claiming copyright in the images that they put on their, the, yeah. the, the digital images they create of public domain artworks are not actually, they can't claim copyright. In yeah. They've, they've, and, and so actually somebody, an artist painting a picture of an AI generated picture, which is in the public domain mm -hmm. because it can't be copyrighted, would actually not be able to copyright that image. So that, so if I paint or like digital cholera, somebody would call it. Uh, in front yeah, of so if I, if I paint a copy of the Mona Lisa and it's so good, it's indistinguishable from the Mona Lisa, except for, you know, the molecular level, then I don't have copyright in my painting because it's too close to the other. But if I were to change the background so that it didn't, the hills weren't as high, then I'd be fine. No, we're not talking about painting it. I mean... Actually, that's interesting. They were talking about photographs, like if you take a picture of the Mona Lisa. Yeah. You, you know, usually when a museum takes a picture of, of an artwork, they want it to be as accurate as possible. Yeah. But, well, I know that, that that's been the case for a long painting, time. But if you were painting a copy of the Mona Lisa and you changed the background and stuff, then it becomes a derivative work. And I guess you can copyright that. Yeah. So all you have to do is to, um, and this is um, a lot of what um, I'm hearing in the games industry is people are using things like uh, mid journey um stable diffusion to uh to create concept art ideas just generate ideas right and they are then curating the ideas and editing them and saying that's the style or that's the kind i want i want something that looks like that and then they're taking it away and 
working on the concept themselves. So they're getting the ideas from it. Um, but that I mean, for me, it's like an ordinary tool, really. It is an ordinary tool at that level. Yeah. Um, but it's the getting your um, AI to write a book and create a cover for it and sticking it on um, the Kindle store. You can do you know, hundreds of those a day. You can flood the Kindle store. With well, them. Amazon already has a problem with with spam books. Yeah, it does. And there's a there's a piece in Vice, I think it is, or maybe The Verge today, about uh, a large portion of the web now being AI generated, and particularly mm. in languages that are you know, small minority yeah. languages. Yeah, it's a huge problem because um, there's there's not very there's not enough to make. There's not enough data to make a large yes. language model, and so <laughs> yes, the sir. translations are really, really terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, um, Spotify is another one that, that people are just bot spamming. Um, if there was some kind of um, an entry fee so to put your book on um, a Kindle store, it costs you a hundred dollars. Well, that would stop people from just spamming them mm -hmm. um, because they'd have to sell some copies to make a profit. But why would Amazon do that? Because people are just going to be buying books no matter what, aren't they? So uh, it would probably take um, some kind of government in, um, intervention. But the, the other problem with um, with IP isn't some isn't even AI. It's the fact that if there are millions of people creating works there's going to be a coincidence, even if they're not using AI. Um, there was a game, um, City of Heroes, it was an MMO um, uh, set in a superhero world. And um, they were sued by Marvel because there were some, um, it was possible to create Marvel characters in City of Heroes. And they said, look, you, you can't, we've got 4,000 copyright characters here and you can't let your users create them. So um, the developers went through looking at all about a million characters um, to see if they resembled um, copyrighted ones. And they found that there was something like 11 of them were and half of those were created by Marvel just to test that they could do it. But the thing is, um, uh, the, the, the court case petered out because if Marvel had won, they would have established that um, every time they created a new character, they had to check it against a million characters created in. So how are they going to do that? And likewise, if the, the people who are saying, well, your song on Spotify sounds just like mine, well, are you going to check your song against the millions and millions of others to make sure it doesn't sound like someone else's? You just you have a, an just, AI check it. Much. Just program an AI well, to do you those can, checks. You but can I, program an AI to do those checks and you'll find many, many, because it doesn't matter what you're singing. There's so many songs out there. Someone will have made one that yours is like. I wonder if one use of AI in creating games would be, I mean, you mentioned earlier a kind of lapse of logic in a game, the the weight of the leaf versus the weight of the ice. <clears throat> and I know that in games there can be a, a lot of things that are really challenging the logic of reality and that to be fully immersed, you want the, the game to feel pretty real. And it seems like you could yeah. you could program an AI to sort of analyze the game design to look for lapses like that. I wonder if anybody's well, doing that. I don't think they are doing it. I think the game developers are well aware of the lapses, but they put them in because it's too expensive not to. And so many games have put things in that um, now the, the players actually expect some of these behaviors and would be snapped out of their immersion if they didn't do anything. So for example, yeah. Dropping an object on the floor, there should the object should land on the floor, maybe bounce, maybe roll away until it gets to a point of rest. If you're playing an MMO, you drop an object on the floor, it disappears. The players expect it to disappear, and if it doesn't disappear, oh, oh, okay, so this works just like in reality. So they've had to readjust their um, 
version, their vision of the world, how the world, the virtual world works to match the updated one. So there are issues there, but realisticness, which is what we call it, uh, mainly is mainly observed in the negative. Some things are unrealistic, meaning that there's no fictional explanation as to why this works like it does, but it doesn't work like reality. And reality is the backstop. And um, if it's not, if there's not a, a fictional um, cover for it, then it should work like it does in reality. And what sometimes it doesn't. That, Sorry? That, isn't that like one of the things you used to talk about, which is players, characters respawning or coming back to life? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, that's right, because they don't like it when their character dies. Um, uh, now, in the real world, um, as far as we know, you don't come back to life if you die and don't try it at home, kids. But um, no one ever has, um, except in um, assorted um, religious stories. Well, there's some stories uh, of reincarnation, but um, usually, usually you can. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, so um, it's uh, the... If you die in a computer game, then you, you expect to come back. You, uh, but if you kill a, an orc, you don't expect the orc to come back, at least not straight away. You know, you've killed it. It should be dead. But your character um, isn't killed. It's um, it's run away or it's afraid or it's stunned or whatever. Um, and some games do try to make, um, try to have reasons for this. I um, mean, in the secret world, your character really is... Um, immortal because basically because they swallowed a bee um in um in lord of the rings online your character um has a morale failure if they die um so they're not dead they're just sort of they run away just in time although quite how that um that works when you've just jumped off weather top and landed splatted on the ground it's like morale failure yeah uh, so it, it, it's not carried through but at least they make the effort but most of them don't. Um, most of them, you, it just happens that um, you're not dead. You know, you respawn somewhere else and have to run back to your corpse or whatever. Uh, Wasn't there a concept of permadeath? Yes, permadeath. We had that in, in um, the original Mud. Uh, if your character was killed, then that was it. Your character was dead. Um, and the reason for that, um, well, partly to do with realisticness, but also it meant that you could restart. So that if you were, um, you could try on another identity. You could wipe the slate clean and not be the person that you were before. You could be a new version of yourself who um, was um, more, that was closer to how you were, you know, how the real you was, um, or further away if you had to do more experimenting. Um, now, if you talk about permadeath to today's players, they really don't like the idea because oh, I die 10, 20 times a night in World of Warcraft. Well, yeah, but it was really actually quite difficult to get killed in mud. Essentially, you had to um, you had to take a risk. Do I think I can kill my opponent before my opponent kills me? And if I don't, then I'll flee. And if I do, I'll hang around. And if my judgment's wrong, then I get permadeath. I get killed. So most characters towards the end, they were living you know, three months and they wouldn't be killed because they weren't taking that risk. You know, it wasn't a, they, they weren't testing their luck. But one of the things you get from permadeath is... Um, players are able to defend themselves so in the, when you've got games where people ganging up on you um yeah that's fun if you survive but it isn't if you die and it turns out that all the killers the ones who went around trying to um take the the trying to take the lives of other players and, and destroy them yeah that's great until you that one time when you lose and then it, you're the one who it's all gone and half the time you do lose because um, someone always loses a fight. Um, yeah, you can stack the odds, attack people who are weaker than you when they're not expecting it. But then it only takes some random monster to appear and join in against you and then you're a goner. So 
it was a non-winning strategy and that's why we left it in because people learned that if you want to be a jerk to other people then you're not going to get far Whitney had said something earlier about how we should discuss the state of gaming um mm -hmm. and i just wonder do you have some general thoughts about the current state of games and the trends that you see uh currently in the way game development is evolving well well at the moment it's um it's sad because so many people are losing their jobs like you know, a third of the industry lost their jobs last year it's that it's really bad most people who joined the games industry have left within 10 years um, there's a big shortage of senior people very hard to get um senior designers or art, uh, lead artists and so on uh but the game industry it doesn't pay enough if you're a good programmer then you have to be very passionate about games in order to be a games programmer because you could uh, earn more programming in electric light bulbs than you could earn programming in games I and mean, pretty well anything games is almost the lowest amount that you could uh, be paid as a programmer um, if you're any good so the industry itself is reconfiguring what tends to happen in these situations is the the people who have, have lost their jobs um, groups of them get together they form new companies some of which are um, successful and we get new um, perspectives new um ideas coming out new kinds of games we also get a lot of rubbish um people who are creating games that they want to play rather than games that people want to play people who are designers of games but not game designers they've got the craft but they haven't got the art so they don't understand there's an art they think it's all to do with craft but you do get people who have an instinct they know that if you make a game then it, if it's got a spine if it's got a vision then it'll be better than one that isn't um the main problem you've got is getting users people to try it um uh, here's my game please play my game um is that because people are wedded to the legacy games they're familiar with um in part but uh there i mean there's always people coming along new people coming along um and they and what tends to happen is that genres are diluted so the games that you like to play have got easier they've got e the kind of games have become easier because they've been adding quality of life things to it or they've changed it because the culture of the current generation is such that people aren't willing to read manuals or to invest time losing a game before they figure out how to how to play it to win it so there are cultural aspects to it um and what you grew up playing uh, you're right wendy does uh, um, affect what people are um uh, are accustomed to and what they want and what they believe games to be um in my own field virtual worlds and mmos today's are well in, in, in 2000 they would have been called derided as care bear games okay. and now the hardcore players uh, um then then they're no hardcore than the than the care bearers were but they are relative to the others they're they're very hardcore um is it is is it seems to me like mobile phones have changed the game in in a lot of other ways on the internet mm. you know uh is that true in games as well yeah um most of the money in games comes from mobile phones and the monetization of them has um i mean it works for casual players but it um it undermines the um the players who are wanting to spend a lot more time playing well not so much a lot more time a lot more um put a lot more effort into playing games uh because you I mean you can play tetris for four hours but uh P, um, the ones that require more strategy more thinking the more advanced games 
um, the, the the shift from Sidney Brown playing a match three or match four these days game to playing a strategy game, you know, one of the paradox games, Europa Universalis or um, Victoria or the Crusader Kings, those kind of games, making that that leap is not something that's um, facilitated. There, are, there aren't many um, ways to onboard it. And, the, and that that can lead to the same problem we had we were talking about earlier with the text adventures where they're great if you've grown up playing them and understand them all and you know all the things in them, but they're in, incomprehensible if you haven't, yeah, I think, if you come across one. But yeah. I think what you're describing in a way is, is it's very typical of other arts too. Um, you know, like for example, the folk scene, it was a big folk mm -hmm. boom in the 1960s and there were a bunch of us mm -hmm. that came along in the 70s. And a lot of the musicians that I know on the folk scene who've been around for that long, their audience has aged along with them. You know, mm. some of them do attract younger audiences now, but but a lot of them, you know, the bulk of their audience has been with them since they were, you know, 30 or 25 or something. Yeah. And, you know, if you think about the 1980s, comedians were really big and everybody, all these comedians were getting their TV shows. And I bet Jerry Seinfeld's audience is pretty much who it was, you know. Yeah, then. yeah. Yes, um, and you know it's like every generation has its its um, its medium of choice and its and its artists of choice. Yeah, you know? it does. Um, but there's a difference between a person and and an, an artwork. So if you read a book, you, you might read a book because it's by your favorite author. But if your favorite author's dead, you're still going to read the book. It's not like you're aging with the author. And yeah. to some extent, games are like that because um, it doesn't matter who's made the games. The games are permanent artifacts, so long as you can still find some something that simulates the original hardware and you can play it on. Maybe uh, more comparable to movies then. Uh, yes, yes. I mean, there's certainly the, yeah, dated movies and you watch them and think, oh, good Lord. And it's similar to that with um, with some games. Yes. But but then again, the retro game scene, there are things like pixel games. Um, it's used as a signifier to tell you that this is the kind of game that in the past were pixel games. We don't have to do pixels this time, um, although it's really cheap because we can get the um, sprite sheets off the Internet. But we are using pixels because that gives you uh, an indication as to the kind of game that we're making. Um, it's it's a look and feel thing. Um, and people will pick up on that. Um, big differences, though, um, are there. Yeah, they were. I mean, the. <laughs> The problem we have with games is, is it's like the studio system with movies back in the 30s and early 40s, where everybody knew what the studios were, but they didn't know who the directors were. So you knew that you might have heard of you know, MGM did musicals. Everybody, if you want to go see a musical, watch an MBM, MGM. Yeah. You might have known a Busby Berkeley, but how many others? And so we don't have in games, we don't have this. Um, uh, the, the, the big names that there are hardly any big names in game design and even the ones that we have um they're they're not necessarily great at designing games they're just a lot lot better than pretty well everybody else's uh but that doesn't mean they're great it just means that they're that they're better so the, the some names people will know and i mean in my industry everybody would know raf costa for example and um in the UK game scene, everybody would know um, Peter Molyneux. Um, in the US, um, names like Richard Garriott still have quite a lot of kudos and um, Sid Meier. But these are few and far between. I mean, um, if you ask people uh, who was the, uh, the designer for World of Warcraft, well, do they know? They know the studio, Blizzard. And they might know the managing director of Blizzard, although he's just been um, lost his uh, his position, uh, 
Kotrick. But as for the designer, well, who was it? Rob Pardo, I think. But the thing is that you don't know that if you're as a player because you only ever see it as a Blizzard game. You only ever see this is a Bethesda game. Um, this is this is a, um, a, some, a Sony studio. Well, the um, way that, that changed in the movies was that the movie theaters were forced to divest. Uh, mm. the, the studios were forced to divest theaters and uh actors became free agents instead yeah. of being contract players is yeah. that what's needed in the games industry would that make that would that make some kind of difference we we do need um the recognition of auteurs in the games industry it, i mean you, you look at some of the um the, the credits for games and you know it can take you 25 minutes to scroll through some of the credits again there's so many people in the triple a ones <laughs> And it will start off with all sorts of studio heads and people who put up all the money. You've got to go some way before you see that it's um, um, who the direct, who the either the lead designer or the um, chief creative officer, if it's that big a project, was. And by that time, how many people? I mean, most of the players won't have even got that far. Uh, so it's hard for somebody to trade on their name. Um, particularly since if there are 800 names on the list and um, that means anybody can, uh, of those 800 can say yeah I worked on let's say Baldur's Gate 3 yeah I worked on Baldur's Gate 3 they can say they might have been an intern for three days but their names on the credits and there they are well that's true of movie, uh, that's true of movies too hmm. but in the end every movie comes down to some poor slob of a writer in, in his in his office with a with a computer desperately trying yeah. to, to fill the blank page and i have yeah. i've always wondered isn't that true of games as well doesn't somebody doesn't yeah. before the game is designed doesn't there have to be some writer sitting there coming up with a story and, a, yeah, and, well, a theme and all the rest of it the game designer has to come up with the game design because games are about gameplay ahead of, if, if they don't have any gameplay they're not then then well, yeah, it doesn't it, matter what else they've got. If they haven't got a story, well, what's the story for Tetris? It's the story that you yeah, create while you're playing it. I mean, well, yeah. what's games the, are what's machines the story for, for generating. Nukem? What's the story for Duke Nukem, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's the title. <laughs> yeah, like Space Invaders, what's the story of Space Invaders? Well, space is being invaded by Space Invaders. So um, uh, there is somebody has to has to... Um, do there, there will be someone whose creative vision is being realized and the industry should be rewarding these people there should be um, best game design and the name goes there not larian studios for Baldur's gate 3 it should it should say who the designers are but particularly the lead one whose vision is being realized um there are some companies that don't even recognize the designers are the um the creative force they put it to the producers because if the producer wasn't there getting it all together it wouldn't be a it wouldn't have been made yeah but it's the producer isn't saying anything are they it's the designers creating the gameplay and the gameplay carries yeah. the message of games because it has to that's that's the only thing games have got that nothing else has got if you want to make a story or a visual story, you write a book, you write a stage play, you do a movie, you do a TV series. Uh, so we're almost out of time, uh, just a couple of minutes left. And I, I wanted to ask you if there's anything you're really excited about now, other than this interview. Oh, I, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry, I've been ranting quite a bit, but um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> there are lots of things I'm excited about. Um, in the, um, the the problem is that um, since I consult in the game uh, games industry, I can't really tell you everything that I know that's supposed to come out if they ever finish making the game, because then I'll be breaking my non disclosure agreements. But there are some there are some big strides towards things like um, voice fonts. So when I when I'm playing a game at the moment, because of the way consoles are all to do with controllers you if you want to communicate with somebody else you can't really just you've got to speak in text days or even in the early graphical games where people are using keyboards you could type and it came out but nowadays people want to speak and they use discord and stuff but if you if you're speaking i mean if i'm playing as a i don't know female elf 
well, I don't sound like a female elf. I don't sound like a female and I don't sound like an elf. And you still have your East Yorkshire accent, which you are yeah, that's to right. Um, so you could, um, if you if you were to analyze what I'm saying, you could break it down into phonemes, apply a font to it. Um, and then when it, when you hear it at the other end, it comes out in the chosen female elf font. It might not even have a, a British accent. If it follows my tones up and down, you'd probably recognize it wasn't American and you would need that for um, emphasis. But the, it would help with immersion. You could be the, um, away from your um, regular voice. I can see the and, conflict coming already. You know, should people be allowed to disguise their true selves? Uh, well, they do. Where Yes, but you know that some humorless politician is going to come along and start talking about grown men grooming teenage girls you know that. um yeah or teenage boys uh yeah or teenage <laughs> but it's generally generally is grown men yeah who do it but um yes the uh um you can see that but also the politicians will be saying well look you're playing as a as a as a woman and you're not a woman or you're playing as a man and you're not a man uh you're playing as a wizard you're not a wizard um and describing disguising the voices well you can always put on a this voice is disguised little light and i'm pretty sure everybody would know it anyway yeah and although politicians are humorless a lot of them have actually grown up playing games now um, it's in true. the uk in particular yeah if you were um, in your teens in the 80s either you played games or you knew someone played games you know they're not Playing games doesn't make people go out and shoot up schools. I know, but, um, you know, I really hoped by this time that we'd have a generation of politicians who understood about the Internet, and there's no sign of it. I mean, the Online Safety <laughs> Act passed, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes, and then, and then the EU has committees of people who don't understand it to make it even worse. We uh, have reached the end of our hour, and... I feel terrible to stop right now because there's so much more we could talk about. I hope you could come back sometime and talk to us again. Um, yeah, happy to if you're uh, if you're willing to have more ranting. Oh yeah, we're. I mean, we're all about <laughs> ranting. Looking really fun, Richard. Thank you for doing it. Yeah, yeah, great. This was a blast. It was great. <laughs> we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. You can stay in touch with Plutopia at Plutopia.io on Facebook. Look for at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.